Hi, welcome to Future Fast. And like always, we have a very interesting guest. And uh, while you perhaps have read the name, and before I bring in our guest to you, I hope you are enjoying Future Fast. And uh, and if you have not yet subscribed, please do subscribe now. And uh, jumping straight into the conversation, uh, today's guest is Professor Susan. Ramdai. She is a professor, author, and leader in energy transition engineering, and uh, she brings a rich experience of working across different continents, which uh, we hope to catch up in the conversation. And uh, she is currently also the research director at Thailand Center for Net Zero uh, out of Scotland. So with that, Professor Susan, welcome to Future Fast, and thank you so much for making time to be here with us. Sure. Thanks for having me. So, uh, Professor Susan, uh, can you share your journey so far with us? Right. Um, I'm American, so I grew up in Colorado in the Rocky Mountains, um, was pursuing energy engineering, um, sustainable energy, uh, and then finished my PhD, and I couldn't find a position in the United States where people were really looking at sustainable energy. You could look at a particular technology or material science, but you you couldn't really ask, well, how do we actually change what we're doing? And I saw a position opening in New Zealand. And so I went there and um, had basically a lot of freedom because they don't have a lot of funding. <laughs> So uh, attracted some just brilliant students um, and got some colleagues to work with me. And we just kept pursuing how do we change what we're already doing. And then just recently in 2020, I published the book that we're going to talk about. And um, the president of Harriet Watt University um, found that book and thought, well, Harriet Watt University has been at the forefront of steam power, industrial revolution, um, mechanization, and also petroleum engineering and banking and finance and business. And we should be at the forefront of transition engineering. So um, I they made a good offer to set up a program and worldwide um, training and education opportunities via um, online um, courses. And so I thought, okay, um, I'll go to go to the other end of the world. And so that's what I've been doing for a few years now. Um, what brought you to Scotland now? Um, I was offered a position to set up a transition engineering program and um, global teaching and a special master's that is in Orkney, which is a, a little island at the at the top of the British, um, or at, above Scotland there, north of Scotland, um, where you sort of have this 8,000 years of history of continuous occupation, which looks like it was kind of the center of a European um, thought. Um, did you, did you say 8,000 years? Yes, yes, as soon as the ice age cleared off, People moved in and have oh, been wow. here ever since. Yeah. So um, that just, you know, as an American where um, it's really hard to find history and prehistory, so it's a very new country. Um, I thought, you know, going back to to these roots and picking up that narrative of that we really can be here for a long time, that we, we've got 8,000 years behind us just on this island. And I know other places, you know, like Australia, you go back 60,000 years. Um, but how in all that time have we never really gotten past future blindness? Why, why, do we, why can we not look forward in the same way we look backward? And so I just thought, well, maybe this, um, the spirit of the place and given the position of leadership to set up a transition engineering program. Um, and we're also doing action research. So that means working with um, companies and councils and communities on a uh, transition to net zero. So we're actually doing the transition engineering. So that that was that was worth leaving New Zealand, which was tough because my my kids and grandkids are there. But um um, well, we plan to go back. <laughs> well, it, it's it's 
not just moving from south end to the north end, but you also moved to a place with 8,000 years of history, human history. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so, New Zealand is unique in that it's got maybe a thousand years of human history all up. You know, the 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 native people um, came in there, you know, maybe a thousand years ago. Probably sit by six hundred, they they were they were there, and and yeah. So so you have how nature was on its own for basically all of history. And then that that human impact um, is is very clear to see in New Zealand. Wonderful. Well, before I ask you about transmission engineering, uh, I, it would be good to understand your uh, uh, approach to sustainability. So, uh, so that I think you you approach transmission engineering from sustainability point of view. So, if you can set the context for our listeners and audience, right. Well, we've we've all got some kind of journey, and if you're um, sixty like me, you probably remember um, the oil crisis, the Air OPEC oil embargo. If you're an American, you definitely do that. That was a shock. It was called an oil shock, is what it was called, and because the electricity grid had um, really built up a lot of diesel generation to meet peak demand. It was also an electricity grid failure. There were blackouts. There just wasn't enough fuel to run the grid. And that was with objectively a 7% reduction in the amount of fuel supply, which, <laughs> you know, it, it, that means there's there's no resilience in this system. There's There's no way to handle it. And I was um, growing up in a part of Colorado where there's the one national park in the United States that is dedicated to prehistory. There's there's um, um, the native people's dwellings. It's called Mesa Verde National Park. So that sense of this, you know, this long chain of people living out their lives and and um, going about the way they they lived. Um I just really, that word sustainability started to crop up. You had terrible pollution problems and safety problems through the 60s and 70s. Um, and so by the time I went to university, I was really interested in anthropology because, you know, how do we organize ourselves to get through these kind of things? Like, wh why do... <laughs> Why do we not do this very well? What, what are we missing? And then I thought, well, um, it's really important that as people, we have these ways that we deal with things and make decisions. But on the other hand, the things that we're trying to make decisions about, we can't do anything about. They're, they're engineered systems. We didn't build that power plant. We didn't build that road, you know. We didn't build those cars or those oil fields. And so I kind of made the decision to go into mechanical engineering because that's where all the energy engineering is. And it seemed like that that question about how do we um, understand sustainability that the, the engineering fields surely would be addressing that now that we've had these energy crises and pollution crises and, and things like that. <laughs> so that's why I went into mechanical engineering. And I, I fully expected to be taught about sustainability and sustainable energy and um, things like that, and mostly not. <laughs> and so I stayed in university and did a master's um, there was a master's in renewable energy and energy systems. So I did that and energy in buildings and worked in that area for a while and on solar energy. And then I thought, okay, um, I don't see what I'm looking for. There's a lot of, we use the word sustainability a lot, but <laughs> you know, as engineers, we sort of say, well, fine, but what do you really want? <laughs> Right. Yeah, sustainability, that's lovely. But what do you really want? <laughs> and so I pursued a PhD. And the first PhD was in um, combustion, which was about biofuels, a new kind of biofuel. Um, 
And that's where I got my first really interesting life lesson. And that was that this biofuel that the government had funded research on, there were a lot of brilliant in, um, scientists and engineers, you know, playing with the chemistry of how to take wood and turn it into a diesel fuel. My job as uh, the engineer building a combustion system to, to burn the stuff, it, it was clear that this wasn't true, <laughs> that that while we could make a story about that we could coppice wood and turn it into biofuel and then use that that diesel as sustainable fuel for our tractors and it would all be nice and circular, that it wasn't actually true in any sense. But the fact that I was now doing research on it, which I was, I was doing legitimate research. I was doing the methods correctly and I was measuring things. <laughs> But I was now part of the story of that we could do this because I was a researcher working on it. And that dissonance, you know, the word dissonance is when you're holding conflicting ideas at the same time and it's very uncomfortable. Um, I just thought when I wrote the report to the Department of Energy about the, the combustion science, um, I am never going to do this again. I'm never going to... Um, you know, uh, just just look at a story that sounds really good and then do the engineering, which maybe just doesn't, you know, the story isn't true. Um, so I'm not I'm not gonna do that again. Um, and then in my PhD, my my supervisor at Colorado, um, University of Colorado at Boulder was Rishi Raj, who's a guru in high temperature ceramics, and he gave me a project to do that was impossible. Um, and I found out that there's a really big difference between impossible and nonsense. <laughs> because the impossible thing was, it was impossible if you kept thinking about things the way that we always had. So there was a 20 year, um, 25 year experience in a field called chemical vapor deposition, which is how we make our electronics and our coatings and our sensors and things like that. And that experience had had built up into a view of the way that you could do it, which precluded you from doing what Professor Raj wanted me to do. <laughs> so um, I had to decide, am I gonna tell Raj that he's wrong? <laughs> Or am I going to back up and see, is there uh, any real reason, like a, a physics first principles reason why this can't be done? And so I just kept backing up and figured out that, no, actually, if we think about how we do this in a totally different way, just, just flip it over. Everything we always do, we're going to do the opposite. Then I could, I could actually achieve the... Um, the thing that he set. And this whole time I was thinking, maybe he doesn't really understand how this works. <laughs> and then when I finally did it, uh, he, he was really surprised. He was like, oh, I didn't think it, that could be done. <laughs> well, so <laughs> um, that I wanted to do again. I, I liked that. I didn't like somebody giving me a story that was false and then me spending years doing research that didn't have a future. I was uncomfortable being given a thing to do, which all the journal papers and all the books said wasn't possible. But let's take a look, let's dig into it, and let's see if we change the story. Is it actually possible? I really liked that, even though it was high temperature ceramics. <laughs> um, and then I started a company because this invention was actually really cool and I got funding for it. And that company, unfortunately, I picked a customer who was working on hydrogen fuel cells because that was a really great story at the time, back in the back in 2000. <laughs> and so I spent all of my um, all of my cash and my people's time again on this thing, which was a false story. Ah, <laughs> So uh, I said, okay, I, I said, I didn't want to do that again. And I'm not dumb, right? I'm pretty smart. So why didn't I see it coming again? Why didn't I see that that story is just too good of a story? Why, why, why didn't my 
energy engineering brain click in that, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> because it took years before I finally started going, wait a minute, if, if we're going to use this for energy, then it needs to actually be like mm, energy economical. And that then led to new ideas, but it also led me to, to say, okay, I'm, I'm not going to work on hydrogen anymore. There's plenty of people working on that. And I'm going to go work on, okay, how do we actually change what we're doing that's not sustainable? So that's the long way around to getting to how I think about sustainability. Sustainability is a very interesting place where you can make up stories and you can, you know, say it a lot, but it's very nebulous. It's hard to hard to pin down what what you mean, right? What do you mean by sustainability? Now, if you think about unsustainability, every person has a gut understanding of what unsustainability means, the same way that we understand what's unsafe, right? You don't have to wait till somebody comes along and puts a yellow, uh, you know, yellow and black striped uh, tape in front of a 2000 foot cliff for you to figure out that that's a dangerous thing. <laughs> Right. So you know, when we talk about safety, there are people who work to make things safe, but what they're really doing is trying to um, elimin identify, manage, and eliminate the hazards and risks. So security is the same, that we want to make things secure, we want to have secure supplies of water, but what we're really doing is looking forward at what are the risks to our secure supply and managing those. And so sustainability absolutely has to be the same thing. We have to be looking at the risks posed by what we are doing and work on changing them so that we reduce the risks and manage the risks. And that we can actually do, but that's maybe the most dangerous idea out there because it means change of things that a lot of people don't want to change, but everybody can understand what unsustainable means. So, so we're going to talk about unsustainable from here on. <laughs> Very good. But uh, just before that, uh, uh, it's so often we find uh, people like you, right, who are highly academically accomplished, and there are people who are very well grounded in science for years together. And uh, uh, how is it that they get carried away with some of these narratives and uh, spend again years towards? Uh, I heard from another good friend, uh, which he said he didn't coin it, but I heard it from him, Paul Martin, which is hopium, right? Uh, the, so, how is it that these people get driven by this kind of a hopium despite their solid years of scientific education and grounding? I mean, what do you think? What is that trigger? Why do they lose the track? You said you also got carried away for some time. So what oh, is yeah, it that, yeah. So what happens? Why why do people get carried away? I mean, of course, you checked yourself, but some people keep going on the same direction for many more years before. So... What well, happens? okay. What, where I mean, do you lose the track? Specialists. So, so people who study, you know, uh, uh, to be a specialist, you you narrow, narrow, narrow your focus, right? That that's that's what you're doing. Um, so that doesn't um, give you insight into whole systems thinking. We can all have it, but we have to purposefully think. Um, so I think that we all whether whether you're a, a scientist or an engineer or a banker we all have a um legacy 150 year old brain right 150,000 year old brain this this way of understanding the complex world we're in understanding each other remembering a bunch of stuff that we really need to remember um, participating in cycles of life, we, we've we evolved this way of being because it, we survived. If it didn't work, we wouldn't be here. And so we are all really pre-programmed, um, uh, pre so to speak, um, to follow right because we we have to we have to follow the traditional stories and the traditional knowledge 
or we we probably will make mistakes and induce risks into the system. And then you have <clears throat> the the scientific era and that capitalized for profit creates a, a runaway train, basically, that our society doesn't know how to manage. And we're, we're all feeling that. We're all understanding that we're on this runaway train. And so we're hoping that somebody knows how to run it. <laughs> somebody knows how to, how to make it work and, and not crash. And none of us are that person because we, you know, we're passengers. And so if somebody comes along and gives us something to alleviate the fears, because we we do perceive that that things have gotten ahead of themselves, then of course we'll take that. Of course. I mean, you, you can call it hopium. I think hope is different from hopium because we all should have hope. But hopium is when a con artist has figured out how to monetize that hope. <laughs> And how to extract funding and wealth and stuff from the fact that we all have hope. So don't stop hoping, but watch out for the person who's trying to sell something to, um, yeah, <laughs> to go along with that hope. Yeah, um, uh, but I, I, I also do believe that many a times uh, they may not be trying to con, but why do they get lost in thinking what they're doing is the right thing? So I think... I mean, there are some who uh, are surely conning and there are some who are intention is not to con, but somewhere they are lost. They, they, uh, they right. are the, well, they are the, the unintentional believer. con of, yeah, the unintentional con of being a researcher working on it that then, you know, creates even more of that story. Um, I, I am actually forgiving um, of people who, who get caught up in that because I have been, I understand it. And what is it? It probably is that hope again. I wanted to work on solutions. Right? I, I wanted to work on the good thing that we needed. So, so you want to make hundreds. this a hope bubble and that's a hope you. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I'll tell you what, as a, as a researcher, once you're sort of in it and now you're just working on the science and, and how to make that um atomizer work, you know, your, your head's down and, and, and the, the bigger questions are just not there. So um, I know we're going to talk about transition engineering. That discipline has my experience in it that we all have to question. We all have to pick our heads up and look at the bigger picture and ask, wait a minute, does this story make sense? Right. <laughs> it's actually step three in the method. <laughs> I'm not getting well, caught again. <laughs> well, before we go to transition engineering, I just want to ask you, uh, you did mention uh, uh, why you chose to do mechanical engineering. And I think this is a very interesting uh, thing I've ever heard that you were so curious about anthropology and that led you to why people do and that got you to do mechanical engineering. And of course, that is not what you learned, but you got into it. Uh, but how do you see uh, uh, today? Because uh, there are few things that are happening from India perspective. I can, if I can just share one that uh, today uh, for quite some time, right? Uh, uh, generally, this mechanical engineering is not a preferred elective for most of the women. So uh, that's one. And uh, two, unfortunately, uh, uh, in the last few years. Uh, uh, Many of the engineering colleges uh, are getting very low registration for mechanical engineering course itself. Most people want to do only uh, software and uh, IT and various other things, right? Within that realm of uh, uh, information technology. So, uh, what would you like to tell them? Uh, all right, the plug for mechanical engineering. Well, um, I said I was really interested in anthropology, and I am sociology, psychology, anthropology, the the the, the human system. And back in the day, in the eighties, luckily we still had humanities at university, and so I've taken about as many courses as you would need for a degree in humanities while I was doing the engineering. 
Um, so I, I did pursue those studies, sociology of language, sociology of change, you know, just, just all of these really interesting things. Um, and I would encourage any technical engineering software person to uh, to pursue the humanities. We we do need to understand oh, human well, systems that's as much another, as we understand. That's another aspect. In fact, the uh, number of students going into studying humanities is also significantly dropping. Most people don't want to study yep. humanities anymore. And within engineering, most people don't want to do mechanical engineering. They only want to do IT or software. So the two of the things what you're recommending are what is not of interest. Uh, so. Advice falling on deaf ears. Well, mechanical engineering, um, uh, all of the engineering is um, is fun stuff, if you like problem solving and making things work. Um, but mechanical engineering is a little special because it it's, number one, it's right in the middle of, of all energy systems. Use it, Things that use energy, things that produce energy um, and the, the the safety of those energetic systems. So, so mechanical engineering just is in the in the center of all of this. And it's also um, the field of engineering where you continuously learn new things because you're a systems engineer. So if you're working on a product that has that say like a stroller, you have to learn about infant physiology and infant behavior and um, mothers and the relationship between mothers and infants in order to design a good product. Um, so, you know, for example, <laughs> um, so you're always learning outside the sphere of the narrow area that you're in. So um, I think definitely in the 30 or so years that I've, I've been in academia in, in engineering, I've seen that there's these huge swings of what students are pursuing in because of what they perceive is a is you know the field that's hot at the moment. Um, but there are fields of engineering that our civilization absolutely stands on, and and those are, um, yeah, the the civil, mechanical, chemical, and, and electrical, um, you know, architectural, the the things that that actually build our world. So the software. Um, yeah, that's that's running hot right now, <laughs> uh, and we do use a lot of it. That's for sure. But uh, yeah, I don't know what to tell you. That it's probably just one of those swings. Uh, usually, after a big swing in one direction, you'll have a bunch of retraining, which is why we have masters, because there's a lot of fundamentals that are kind of the same. But you can then, um, uh, you know, pull what you've already learned into into one of the other areas. So we'll see how that goes. So yeah, hopefully that swing will change soon. So uh, now getting to the core of it about your title of your book as well, and you even mentioned transition engineering. So can you give a quick introduction to transition engineering? Because we are going to talk more and each aspects of it in another section of our podcast. So please. Right. Well, if you've got a broad um, audience for your podcast, then what I've found is that the 2% of the working population who are engineers, who have engineering training and, and follow an engineering discipline, um, couldn't really tell the other 98% what engineering is. <laughs> but the other 98%, if you do a poll, they put engineers, even though they couldn't really tell you what, what they do, they put engineers at the absolute top of the most trusted professions, above doctors, above lawyers, way above politicians. <laughs> and so we we all know we need them for something. Right? Um, and so engineering basically just means applying science as opposed to opinion, using rigor and mathematical modeling, which means as opposed to my gut feeling, um, and following a discipline, which means doing things in a proper way, even if they're hard, to achieve um, a required outcome. So we have requirements that we're working to. All right. So if you look around at fields of engineering, you've got the, the backbone ones, like I said, that sort of build the world we're in. Um, and then you have these other ones that are transdisciplinary. 
disciplines. They they are found in all of the dis, all of the engineering disciplines, and um, probably the one you might be the most familiar with is safety engineering. That safety engineering has has a few principles, and those principles are about the perspective that you take. So safety engineering, the the primary principle is prevent what is preventable. So it's got this sort of corrective that that we're going to see what the risks are, what the hazards are, and we're going to stop a bad thing from happening. We're going to limit what we do. We're going to control what we do. We're going to um, also, we're going to modify behavior. So it's not just about technologies at all. And it isn't just the designer's behavior, which we're going to limit. You know, we're going to have crash tests. We're going to have, uh, you know, you have to think through, could an infant stick their finger into this right? <laughs> and get electrocuted? So therefore, we can't have openings bigger than this, even though it would be nice for cooling. And so we, we have to think through the human interaction with the artifacts and environments that we create and keep people from having an accident. So there's this preventative and corrective and also a participation in society with the systems. I mean, uh, I don't know. In India, do you have stoplights? <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen the videos on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but whatever that is, people are participating. They're they're behaving in a way that makes things work. All right. So that also works its way up into management, finance, and policy. It doesn't come down. It goes up. So safety engineering, keep that firmly in your mind that this exists. It's one of the reasons why, why you know, we, we don't die in huge numbers and it also very often comes after a terrible disaster that we make big corrections. Um, so you can think of a number of those, <laughs> that, that there's been a, a, a real failure of an otherwise profitable and legal, legal system. It then gets re-engineered so that can't happen again or the risk of it happening is very low. And, and that's really, uh, that has to be done, you know, on the shop floor in, in the system itself. All right. So if we take that thinking into sustainability, into this question of our future, well, that's safety on a global scale, isn't it really? I mean, if, if you have an unsafe work environment, you might not live through the day. If you have an unsafe, um, you know, transport system, you might you might kill a lot of people. So, so that's your immediate um, survival. And sustainability is actually our long-term collective survival. And not just humans, of course, but but um, nature itself. So that means we, we recast the, the way we think in the same way that you do with safety, which is about preventing what's preventable. So what will we not do? What will we set limits on? What will we correct? And to do that, you just have to see what it is that needs correcting, what it is that's causing failures and catastrophes, and now change that. So those systems are the same kind of system. They're our transport, our buildings, our um, water. They're all engineered systems. And so the engineering to transition those systems to manage the risks of unsustainability to to downshift the unsustainability that has to be an engineering job and again it's transdisciplinary it goes through all disciplines and it involves the user behavior and the culture and it pushes up so for you know since club of rome since the 70s We've been waiting for the politicians to take action. We've been demanding that you know the economy um, have have green growth or something. We, we've been waiting for solutions to come to come from on high, and that probably it has been a folly. That's not going to happen. So um, if you think about that, two percent of the working population is the people who will deliver that transition through rigorous scientific, mathematically based redesign and redevelopment of existing systems. That's how we get to a future that we can all survive and thrive in. 
So that's what transition engineering is. It's not, uh, we don't even use the word solution because that's that old way of thinking. We we look for the um, the changes and then we engineer those changes. Um, so it's a from a line of work sense, that everyone can get into. <laughs> right. So, but from an academic sense, you're positioning it as a post graduation because uh, otherwise you'll say that it's a multidisciplinary right at the uh, starting, then it, it it becomes far more expanded effort, right? Well, um, again, if we look at safety engineering, there are very few undergraduate engineers who come through their degree never having heard the word safety. Mm, right. It's a culture. So how do you how do you approach them? How do you approach them? Because at the same time, transition when it is multidisciplinary. Uh, but again, if uh, at a uh, at a formative level or as a beginning of engineering program, uh, like you mentioned, right, the foundational programs of engineering, the civil engineering, the mechanical, chemical engineering, and uh, what else did you say? Uh, electrical, 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 uh, electrical engineering, and uh, uh, obviously. Uh, uh, you know, you don't consider electronics and uh, IT as a fundamental engineering uh, approach. But uh, unfortunately, in India, probably produces more uh, IT engineers and uh, electronics engineers than all of this put together. And uh, in fact, recently, that was the joke that was happening after India did this Mars mission and uh, mission to moon. Uh, so all the engineers who work in uh, ISRO Indian Space Research Organization, the good majority of all of them, were coming from tier two engineering colleges. So the joke was that the tier one produces the CEOs like Sundar Pichai of Google and and uh, such, uh, and also the CEOs for many of the World Bank and all those global banks. Uh, so. Uh, the tier one leading engineering institution produces bankers and CEOs, and the tier two engineering colleges produces uh, again business leaders and sales guys. But uh, good engineers come from the tier two town. So, uh, so, oh dear. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, um, uh, again, we in transition engineering, I think the real breakthrough is to see that we are a uh, a, another type of um, safety, security, sustainability engineering. We're in that we're in that space. So if we look at how those corrective transdisciplines have de developed over time, um, the first ones, really the first big ones, 1911, and that is worker safety and fire safety, and then they just keep coming, waste management, um, natural hazards engineering, uh, emergency management, um, earthquake engineering. So there's just all of these fields of engineering that um, emerge after a, um, usually after a big disaster. It, it, you know, petroleum engineering, they had a huge safety renaissance after the, right. the Macondo uh, and the um, Piper Alpha, these big disasters, um, which of course they knew were coming. They could have could have prevented them, but they didn't have the discipline to to prevent them until there was a big disaster. So we're saying, look, um, the disaster is upon us when it comes to unsustainability. It's it's clear enough. We can we can go now. <laughs> um, and so the the transition engineering, I think it's um, um, it's a thing that comes from the professions, right? It, it, professional engineers are required to deliver. And they deliver um, for the benefit of society, according to the requirements they're given. And uh, they, they follow a practice called duty of care. So that means just paying attention to making things right. Uh, hopefully that's still taught at your tier two universities. <laughs> I, I, I think so. I guess that's how they are able to come up and uh, build these technologies to fly to moon and Mars. And all that, but uh, unfortunately, well, it's a it's a checklist thing. It's about you know, um, have you checked to make sure that that this is safe or that this will continue to work or whatever. So it's a discipline. Discipline means you know, um, following, uh, thinking through, um, not just rushing ahead. 
And so these sort of corrective disciplines have come from the professional layer first, the people at the forefront. And then that impacts the, the education, the, the discipline is then taught at the university. And in the um, safety disciplines, what we see is uh, fire safety. Um, you can tell when you don't have it in your country, that's for sure. And in countries where you have it, it's it's saved un, untellable lives and prevented, um, you know, disasters. It, it's it, We can see the failures very clearly, but the number of programs that teach fire engineering around the world is only about a dozen. So that is a massive impact. So you have the specialization and then that that um, diffusion of that knowledge and practice throughout the whole um, the whole profession and and different professions, yeah, buildings, um, uh, materials. It, it's it's really an interesting phenomena. So that's where we're positioning transition engineering is to take that same approach. That right now there's um, one program in um, Harriet Watt University. And that's the program that I have just, uh, it's the first year it's running now. And that is a master's level program. And it is focused on energy in particular. But there's two courses on transition engineering in that that are globally available. Um, one's a principles theory and methods course. And one is a practical um, uh, course where you you do a project and, and learn the project management for that. Um, so that, you know, 10,000 engineers a year and and we're we're there in a couple of years <laughs> turning this Wonderful. ship you know <laughs> that's the that's the idea and and there's a global association for transition engineering so there's the professional body that oversees that teaching there's also a course in New Zealand that is being taught again online and in person and there's an in-person course in France at Grenoble University and um, we're looking at pop-up programs um, for undergraduates around the world, a whole network of them. Uh, I'd be happy to work with anyone in India. And like I said, I think you um, it, it will diffuse very quickly because the the being able to get out of those hopium bubbles and actually work on the real things, the, the hard problems that you can work on. Um, and also to re realize a lot of benefits. We've we've really overshot the benefit of a lot of this uh, runaway train that we're on. Um, so it isn't just about the hazards and the and and the you know climate catastrophe and all that. It isn't just about that at all. It's about that we've we've um, we've kind of built a runaway economy, and and we we need to figure out how to make that safe. Well, for the audience and listeners, the links are right below this podcast, so you can reach out to them, and you can also follow her work, and uh, most importantly, the book. Uh, though I think it's used as a textbook, uh, believe me, uh, it's such a good read. So it's it's not the typical textbook that you have to read. It's an easy read, and uh, I think uh, I must uh, congratulate you, Susan, on that. You are a professional writer. You made it so easy reading of it with stories and uh, so it's it's just not a technical book by any means right it's it's so much of uh, historical stories and i think your interest in anthropology is so clearly visible there is how the behavioral changes come about and so it's a great read so i do really recommend and the links are below this podcast itself so please enjoy and go ahead and share it as well so uh, uh susan uh, are there people that have influenced you to be the person that you are today? And uh, who would they be? All right. Well, on a per personal level, um, probably the same as everyone else listening to the podcast. You, you've got your parents and the influence that they have on you uh, in your formative years. Um, my father was a high school science teacher. And so just this observative way of being that no matter what it is in nature, you can always have a really good look at it and see if you can understand what's happening there. See if you can see how that thing ties into other things and yeah, yeah the whole ecology approach. So that was very formative. And then my mother was a was an English teacher. And so I had to learn how to write properly um, from an early age. <laughs> 
So there's there's the first ones. And then probably in high school, um, history for me just seemed so important that that we, yeah, these these stories of how things have gone in the past. Um, and that you'll see in transition engineering is a is a major step that um, there's one thing for sure. It, I, I cannot think of a um, a civilization that just decided they didn't have to have to look at history in any way that that it, it, that would be mad, wouldn't it? <laughs> so. So, yeah, the um, uh, those formative things like that. And then probably at university, I, I was. Um, uh, lucky enough to to be able to do a research laboratory experience as part of my undergraduate. And so working one on one with a, a professor who was a meticulous experimentalist and, um, you know, building the mathematical models of what we were seeing and and, um, you know, the, you know, building the first computer models of those. And so that rigor of, um, you know, careful observation and experimentation. I think that that is uh, fundamental, regardless of what you're doing is, is that, that rigor. Um, I, I know <laughs> we've got a real popular thing now of people being able to say, well, I believe as if that matters, right? <laughs> well, I believe, yeah, whatever. Uh, no, <laughs> if you're, if you're, in your church or in a religious context, you can say that and it matters, but but not about the real world. You you have to you have to go with what you can actually observe. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> right. And uh, would you like to recommend some books, podcasts that you follow to our listeners and audience? Of course, uh, I recommend her book, but. Other than that, would you like to recommend uh, uh, any other book and podcast, if you please? All right. Well, you know, top of the mind right now, I'm reading, I think it's the fifth Ken Follett novel about Kingsbridge. And so these are these are historical novels that have interesting characters, yada, yada. So they're a fun read. But this author, Ken Follett, does a really good job of creating the society of the time and the stressors and the, the beliefs and the inequalities. And so if you can find a book that an, that an author really does that, it's not about the kings, it's not about you know the, the big top level politics, those bore me to death. It's about the, the people... Um, trying to make a living, trying to hold their families together, dealing with the injustices, you know, find an author who who gives you that view of humanity through different um, places in time. And maybe you can you can get that, that that sort of ability to move your mind outside of just the little time bubble that we're in right now, where we're, you know, we're paying attention to the latest dumb thing some strange politician said. Um, <laughs> and and really start start broadening out our view um, our view of uh, of time. Now, have I ever found an author that helps you do that going forward? I've found that when I when I start looking for for people who think into the future, and you, you got this future cast here, right? Um, uh, my son is a writer, and he tells me that the bleak Armageddon future thing, um, <laughs> that, that that is just a really fun setting for a story. And so the the people, you know, there's a few authors um, uh, that that really do think, okay, well, well, what if this kept going and it got to some really bad place? Um, oof, those are hard reading um, and, and they don't seem to actually precaution us very much. Like, you know, 1984 was was written a long time ago when 1984 looked like a long time in the future. Um, so I'm I'm struggling if anybody has a good idea about um, books about the future that really, you know, take a, I don't know, scientific view or something, that would be good. Um, so, yeah. And then uh, I really like reading about e economics, as, not economics like as economics, but um, uh, digging into economics as a belief system. 
and and why is it that we we perceive things the way we do um yeah <laughs> When, uh, so, and podcasts, uh, we do yeah. all we do all listen to podcasts a lot, don't we? Um, I love Throughline from the U.S. from NPR. Again, and something that's current, and then go all the way back. Uh, you know, the one I'm listening to right now is 1619, all the way. Up. Yeah, uh, again, I think we're seeing this history thing play out and philosophy sort of things and um yeah <laughs> wonderful uh thank you so much uh this is wonderful and uh, i'll i'll just add to the last part of it uh future fast which you're already listening to or watching so i uh, do share this and do come back soon because we're going to have more conversation particularly about uh, the book uh, transition engineering that uh, Professor Susan has uh, authored and uh, we obviously can't cover everything but we are going to we pick quite a few interesting things I'm sure you will find it interesting as well so and until then do share this conversation with all those you think uh, like to hear this kind of uh, conversation and uh, if you're not yet subscribed subscribe now and join us soon and till then enjoy the ride Professor Susan once again thank you so much for being part of Future Fast. Sure, it's been fun. <laughs>